right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nova Southeastern University South Florida Geriatric Work Enhancement Program podcast, also known as the South Florida WEP podcast. We're here to educate, encourage, enhance, and promote all those fantastic health professions working with the elderly, including caregivers and their support systems. My name is Sasha Damier, and I am the program manager for the South Florida Web. In today's episode, we are taking an in-depth look at vision and eye care for older adults with our subject matter expert, Dr. Soyid Lee, also known as Sharon, Dr. Sharon Lee. Dr. Lee currently holds the rank of assistant professor at Nova Southeastern University. She is the instructor of record for the low vision didactic course, residency supervisor for the residency program in primary care with an emphasis in low vision and an atten- attending physician in the primary care and low vision services at NSU's main campus and Lighthouse of Broward Clinics. So without further ado, here is Dr. Lee. Hello, Sasha. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for joining us. So, Dr. Lee, today we're talking about the eye care and eye health in older adults. Yes. Can you start by telling us why this topic is important to you? Yes, I wanted to share this topic with you because, you know, along with the changes that occur to the body, our eyes exhibit, our eyes exhibit age-related changes as well. Um, some of those changes are perfectly normal and benign, whereas others are more serious with greater impact on our vision, our eye health, and the overall quality of life. Um, We know that the population is rapidly aging, and we know that the number of people who are visually impaired will increase. So it's important for all healthcare providers who manage older adults to be aware of some of the issues associated um, with visual impairment in the elderly. I know vision for myself is important. I myself have been wearing glasses since I was in the second grade, so I'm very familiar with taking care of my eye health and making sure I I get my... um, your annual check checkups. Um, can you tell us about the NSU clinics and the services that are offered by NOVA's optometry program? Yes, uh, the Eye Care Institute at NOVA offers comprehensive vision and eye health care from our littlest patients, our infants, to our older adults. Um, In addition to the primary care services, there are a number of specialty services that are available. Um, Some of those services include glaucoma, diabetic eye disease and retina service, dry eye clinic, pediatrics, contact lenses, um, sports vision and concussion clinic, low vision rehabilitation, as well as the optical boutique. Uh, We also provide emergency 24-hour services for any ocular emergencies as well. And we have locations not just at the Davy main campus, but uh, throughout South Florida. What are some common illnesses that affect older adults or that you see sometimes in the clinics? Um, so as I mentioned previously, some of the age-related conditions are normal and then others are more serious. So um, I'll start with the ones that are more common benign conditions. Um, one of those being presbyopia. So presbyopia is when the lens inside of our eyes begin to lose its ability to change shape and focus at closer distances. So whereas our distance vision could be fine and things up close may be blurry. Everyone develops presbyopia. And you might have noticed that sometimes you have to trombone your arm and find a spot where it comes into focus for you. And sometimes we wish we had longer arms. Um, And this is when we need reading glasses or a multifocal type of glasses like progressives or bifocals to help with both our distance and near vision. Um, You will need to update your glasses um, every few years. This does not mean that your eyes are getting dependent on the glasses. It just means that the presbyopia is more progressed. Another common benign condition is dry eyes. Um, With dry eyes, you you may feel that your eyes are dry, burning, stinging. It may feel sandy or feels gritty, like something is in your eye. Um, And your vision can also be blurry from dry eyes too. 
There are a number of factors that cause this dry eye, but age tends to be one of the most common reasons. And as we age, our body just produces less tears. And unfortunately, women, <laughs> myself included, tend to experience this more than men. Um, floaters is another common condition. Um, you may notice little dark spots or cobwebs that seem to be floating or swimming in your vision. And these are floaters, or the proper name for it is posterior vitreous detachment, or PVD for short. Um, you might notice this more when you're in a well-lit room, um, looking at a white page or, uh, or a wall. And what's happening is that the center part of our eye is filled with a gel-like substance called the vitreous. Um, and over time, this vitreous begins to liquefy and condense and pull away from the back of the eye. Um, and that's when we see it floating. It on its own is harmless. It's non-site threatening. Um, however, it can cause complications. So if you see hundreds of floaters or flashes of lights or sudden change to your vision, those could indicate a more serious problem like retinal detachment, which requires an immediate, um, immediate attention and treatment. Some of the conditions are more serious, and um, these are known as cataracts, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. Um, these are age-related, but have a much more significant impact on vision. So these are the four leading causes of blindness in the U.S. as well as worldwide. Cataracts is when the lens inside of our eye slowly um, thickens and, and gets cloudy over time. So it reduces the amount of light that we need to reach the back of the eye, the retina, which is known as the film of, um, of the eye or the camera, if you can think of it that way. Um, you might not notice any problems with your vision at first, but over time, your vision can be blurry even with glasses. Colors can appear faded or yellow. You may need more light when you're trying to read up close. Um, and you can even experience glare around headlights, particularly when you're driving at nighttime. On some of the risk factors um, for cataracts is age, um, diabetes, smoking, um, increased exposure to the sunlight are, are some of the more commonly known risk factors. Cataracts is the leading cause of blindness worldwide, but this is treatable by surgery. Um, and what they do is they remove that cataract and replace it with a new lens to restore the vision. However, surgery is not an option for everybody. Um, it might be patient's choice, might be access to health care, um, and just looking at the overall risks versus the benefits may prevent some people from receiving um, that treatment. Age-related macular generation, or AMD for short, um, is another um, one of those four conditions that causes blindness. And with AMD, it affects the macula, the center part of the retina that's responsible for us to be able to see fine detail. Um, and when you have AMD, you can notice that your vision is blurry, and this can be a gradual or a sudden change. You're having difficulty seeing details like your loved one's face or reading. You can also have difficulties with color, contrast, and depth perception. However, your peripheral vision is not affected with AMD. So this won't cause you to have total darkness blindness. There are two types of AMD, the dry and the wet type. The dry is the most common, accounting for about 90% of the cases. Um, and it's more of a, a gradual blur in vision. Whereas the wet AMD, as you can gather from the name itself, is when there's abnormal blood vessels that causes blood and, and fluid to leak out of the tissues. And this has a more significant sudden vision change um, and a much more significant vision loss at the end. Um, glaucoma is a condition uh, where it affects the optic nerve and it's starts by initially affecting your side vision and then gradually takes that away and then your central vision can be affected as well. Once that vision is lost, it can't be recovered. Um, and when patients first, they might not even notice that they have this condition. So it might be something that's detected um, from a routine eye exam. 
So it's important for patients who might have an increased risk, um, like those who are um, older than 40 or have a family history of glaucoma to have their eyes examined more regularly. And then finally, diabetic retinopathy. Um, diabetic retinopathy is a common ocular complication from diabetes. Just like how the diabetes affects the rest of the body, it also causes uh, blood vessel complications to the retina. And there are four different stages, ranging from mild, moderate, severe, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and then the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. There's also something called diabetic macular edema, which is swelling in the macular part of the, of the eye um, that can occur in any of these stages. And the longer one has diabetes, the, the more or increase in the risk of diabetic uh, retinopathy. Um, this diabetic retinopathy is uh, a leading cause of blindness among um, working age adults. So those who are in the, in the ages between 20 to 74. So all of these sight-threatening conditions, they may be asymptomatic at first, and then the prevalence increases rapidly with age. I want to take it back to um, people with diabetes. How would someone with that disease protect their eyesight and keep it from deteriorating? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so... There are certain risk factors that are out of our control, such as positive family history and the genetic factors. So what we want to do is focus on those um, that we can manage. Managing the diabetes is the best way to lower the risk of diabetic retinopathy. So uh, maintaining good blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, being compliant with the medications, and then having positive lifestyle changes like increased and regular physical activity and healthy diet, it's going to be important. As I mentioned, um, sometimes patients might not notice any problems with their vision, but there could be changes going on in the back of the eye. So it's really important for our patients who have diabetes to have a, a baseline diabetic eye exam when they are first told of this diagnosis and then have a regular annual eye exams after. An eye exam is not just about having your vision checked. That's just a sight test. What we want to do is have a dilated fundus exam so that we can take a look at the retina in a more closer detail. And the earlier the treatment, if there are any changes, the earlier the treatment, the better the chances of preventing a more significant vision loss. Um, this applies not just to diabetes, but overall optimal health, but you also want to avoid smoking and uh, protecting your eyes from, from that UV exposure um, and eating a lot of green leafy vegetables, um, diets that are rich in antioxidants and good fat are also going to be helpful as well. As, as we age, should we increase our the number of visits that we have, especially if we have a visual a known visual impairment, or is the yearly um, check checkup um, sufficient? Yeah. Um, so. I would say getting a comprehensive eye exam every year or two, um, even if you don't think you have any vision issues, is going to be important for everyone. And then if you have certain chronic diseases like the ones that we mentioned with glaucoma, AMD, or diabetic retinopathy, it's important to see their eye doctor on a more regular basis for close monitoring or proper management. But each of the conditions are different, um, so it depends on your eye doctor. Um, but I think what's important is to make sure that you uh, follow up um, with them. When would it be considered an emergency in order to um, get a seek emergency assistance for an eye issue? Um, I think if you experience a sudden vision loss, uh, whether it's affecting your central vision or your side vision in one eye or the other, if there's a sudden change to your vision, um, that would be one main reason to, to seek an emergency um, assistance. Um, if you're experiencing severe eye pain or a new or sudden onset of flashes or floaters in your vision, having any kind of eye injury, if you've fallen, um, red eyes with discharge especially, those are some of the common reasons why you should seek immediate care. Yeah, and what help is available for older adults with severe vision loss in the community? I know NSU has the low vision rehab. Are there any other resources that we that they can tap into? Yes. So 
Vision impairment among the older adults is a, uh, is a very important uh, topic um, because we know that vision loss affects almost every aspect of a person's life, right? From reading to watching TV, hobbies, self-care, and even their health management. If they're having difficulty driving to and from the doctor's appointments or reading their medication bottles, seeing what time it is to put to take their medications it can complicate and worsen any any chronic health conditions that they have um, and we know that falls is a, a leading cause of injury among the older adults in fact cdc has reported that one in four adults experience fall each year and vision loss has been identified as one of the biggest factors in the incidence of falls among the elderly um, in fact, vision loss doubles that risk of falls and even causes depression compared to those who don't have any vision problems. So um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that one, we are preventing and preserving and maintaining their vision uh, or yes, pre preserving and maintaining their vision and preventing that vision loss. But if they have vision impairment, then it is recommended to have a low vision exam in order to maximize their vision and remain independent. Um, you might ask, well, what is a low vision exam and how is it different than a primary care eye exam? With a low vision exam, we focus more on the functional aspect. So an in-depth evaluation of what you're currently able to see and how we can try to improve that vision using tools such as magnifiers, telescopes, um, talking devices, computer and assistive technology. And we also work with a team of low vision rehabilitation professionals who are going to be teaching them skills on how to maintain their daily activities and independence. So it's a combination of physical tools and um, rehabilitation and knowledge tools. So this is a different type than a standard eye exam. Low vision exams are offered by um, low vision doctors, both optometrists and ophthalmologists. Like you had mentioned, we have that service available at the Eye Care Institute, the Lighthouse of Broward, Miami, and the different counties um, also provide low vision care. And then you can get more information on, um, on online resources like Vision Aware, um, American Academy of Optometry, American Academy of Ophthalmology, um, as well as Division of Blind Services and the Lighthouse uh, websites will be helpful areas to get additional information. Dr. Lee, what takeaways do you have for other health professionals who are treating patients with visual impairment? Um, very good question, Sasha. A lot of the times I'll have doctors asking me, so when should I refer patients to low vision? How severe does their vision have to be before, before I need to refer them out? And I tell them that there is no set number criteria. Vision, like I mentioned before, is more than just visual acuity. Our visual system has the ability to detect things like contrast or peripheral vision color, depth perception, all of those things can be affected and that and those can potentially reduce um, someone's ability to perform their daily activities. For example, contrast sensitivity is our ability to detect and resolve detail compared to the background. Um, and it's one of the biggest factors when it comes to reading, mobility, and driving. But this is not a test that we think about as a commonly performed test in eye exams. So um, instead of having a strict number criteria, I would say if they are having difficulties with performing their daily activities due to their reduced vision, um, then to re consider referring them to the low vision rehabilitation service. I would also like to take this time to clarify the difference in the terms between vision impairment and blindness. Um, with blindness, when people hear this term, they often think about complete darkness. Um, this is what we call total blindness when there is complete loss of sight. However, only a very small percentage of patients actually have total blindness. Most have some form of vision. 
Legal blindness is another term that you might have heard of. And this is a term that was established by Social Security Administration as a level of visual impairment to qualify someone to receive certain government funded services and benefits. It's based off of visual acuity or their visual field. It doesn't have to be both. So if it's visual acuity, their central vision has to be 2200 or worse. And if it's a visual field, then it has to be 20 degrees or less in the better seen eye. And this person would then qualify as legally blind. The term visual impairment is a more inclusive term, a decrease in the ability to see that can't be improved by the standard treatment of glasses, contact lenses, or surgery. So again, unlike legal blindness, where it was just based off of visual acuity or visual field, this is more of an overall decreased uh, functional vision. As the years move on and we move into different levels of technology, what does the future of optometry look like and as it relates to vision care in your opinion? Yeah, I think this is a very exciting time um, to be in healthcare. You know, with the advancement in technology, uh, we see that in, in the world of optometry and ophthalmology, where we're able to detect diseases earlier um, at the structural levels before there's even any functional damage. Um, so we're able to, you know, um, prevent vision loss. Um, we see improvement in the surgical and medical tools for treatment. And we're able to offer much better tools for magnification and different types of wearable technologies to maximize someone's vision when they do have vision impairment. Um, for the future, I, you know, there's a lot of pers- uh, possibilities that are coming down the line. Um, better treatments for some of the conditions that we mentioned today, gene therapies, you know, cortical in- uh, implants, um, just to name a few. And Dr. Lee, if you have one magic wish, Um, for optometry in terms of research or clinical care or even education, what would it be? Well, (laughs) I have many wishes, so it's hard to (laughs) narrow down to one. Um, But if I had to pick one, I think I would like to see more of these collaborative multidisciplinary um, research especially because we have so many of the disciplines available here at NSU. Um, One example being we had a fall and balance screening uh, fair that was offered to the patients in the community pre-pandemic. But it would be great to have a more formal clinic where all the different disciplines and our students and residents can participate on a more regular basis. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think the audience can can attest to all the information that they received from you today. And if you want to see Dr. Lee in person, you can see her at the NSU clinics, unless you're a a Nova student. (laughs) But Dr. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. And audience, please stay tuned for any of our upcoming topics from our renowned subject matter experts. Dr. Lee, do you have any closing statements? No, thank you so much for having me today.